Welcome. Uh, we have, let's see, I got to admit one more person here. Okay, we have uh, some of the most iconic images in the history of painting to cover today. Da Vinci and um, the birth of Venus. You may also have seen images like these, uh, specifically, I mean, these paintings, I think, uh, more than once in your life, but you may or may not have heard Sorry. You may or may not have heard the facts, the actual verifiable stories behind the paintings, and perhaps you've even heard some of the myths that have often been, uh, uh, you know, perpetrated by who knows, people that didn't do their homework. Uh, I'm going to try to dispel a couple of those myths as we go along. But first, a couple of announcements. Okay, very brief. These won't take long. The first one is that I will be out of state uh, starting tomorrow, and I won't be back until Tuesday after Labor Day. It's the first time my family's been able to take a vacation. <laughs> okay, some background noise. Anyway, the point is I may or may not even have uh, internet where I'm going, and I don't want to be bound to that. So I'm going to just say, if you have an urgent question to, that you need to ask me, if I have enough time to catch my breath when I get home at 11 o'clock or nearly that uh, tonight in Berkeley, we have to leave in the morning uh, for a road trip. And the point is that I, I won't necessarily remember to send you an email reminding you of this. So if you need to contact me, please do it on my voicemail, the one that's at the top of your syllabi. Uh, and that's the Berkeley voicemail, 510-717-6536. That way, I do have phone reception up where I'm going. It's in uh, Western Washington State. Uh, sorry, I meant East, Eastern Washington State. So I should be able to uh, at least respond if it's an urgent question you have regarding something you know that you want an answer. Otherwise, you'll have to wait till Tuesday after the day after Labor Day for me to get back to you by email, unless I somehow get lucky and you know, get consistent Wi-Fi. But I'm, I'm not expecting that. So don't panic if you don't hear from me, you email me and you don't hear from me until Tuesday. Okay, that's the first announcement. Oh, hang on, we got to put this. All right, welcome. Yeah, we're just about to start today's lecture, but I was just saying I'll be out of town and I already gave the phone number out. It's at the top, I'm not gonna do it again. The top of your syllabus, the one that, uh, you know, is the Berkeley 510 number for you to leave a message if it's an urgent question that you just feel you have to have an answer to right away. Otherwise, if you can wait till Tuesday, I will respond to any emails I get then the day after Labor Day. Okay, uh, and the only other thing is I don't think I did uh, this in the last class we had because there was just so many things happening. I might have forgotten. Let me try to help uh, clarify the procedure for your papers when you're ready to turn them in is to have a cover sheet. Now, I didn't send it yet because I don't want to send it too early. It's much better for me to send it, I always do it this way, one week before the due date for your first paper, you'll get a PDF with this cover sheet. Please attach it, you know, electronically, of course, as a single file, if you at all are able to, as a PDF, of course, if that's again, the district requirement. All work is submitted as PDFs at the JC. And then this will be how I or the readers grade your papers. Here's one I graded actually. And you see it's about Michelangelo, the Pieta. And this person got 100% because they did everything. We already went over this last week, uh, sorry, in the last class on Monday. Uh, that, that video, by the way, I almost forgot this. I'm not gonna be able to post that before I leave. I, I don't have time. I've got to pack and get up early in the morning and be in the car. So you won't see those videos uh, posted until probably Tuesday evening from this week's two lectures. Again, don't panic if that happens. In, you forgot. So, okay, so we have at least one more person here to let to admit. Okay, all right. So uh, the point is, I held this up so that you get an idea of what it'll look like, and you do need to download this and attach it to your papers and send the whole thing as a single PDF file. I will send you an email reminding of this well before the due date, along with the PDF of this one-page cover sheet. You see how the numbers are. Mark, this person did everything right. They got all nine elements of composition, thoroughly explained them. They did full length meaning. They, they did a bibliography with the end notes or footnotes. We covered all this with the five requirements handout that I uh, put uh, into the Monday lecture. Okay. And again, you'll be able to see that next week on YouTube, no later than Tuesday night. Okay. So 
I just wanted to give you, I don't think I did give you that, you know, heads up about what the cover sheet is, what it looks like. So um, that will, won't be until, let us do the exact confirmation. I think it's the 22nd, your first paper is due if you want to be, yeah, it is. You have till midnight to give you a little extra time to turn them in. Now, looking at the screen here, I have to, <laughs> I hate this lighting in this office. I think I've said it before. This is a tiny little hole in the wall that adjuncts all supposed to share. And of course, I'm the only one teaching on campus in person this uh, fall in the art department. Uh, it's a phrase my dad would use when he had really bad lighting in a situation. He was actually uh, in a couple of movies, Black Sheep. Anybody heard of Black Sheep? That was a pretty popular comedy. He, he had a major scene in that movie with Chris Farley and David Spade. Uh, anyway, he would sometimes say when he didn't think things look like they're supposed to because the lighting, right, creates deep shadows. You look like death warmed over. Well, that's, I don't feel like that, but that's how I probably look to all of you. So forgive that if that's the impression. None of you look like that. Your lighting at home is much better. Okay, let's get started with today's topics. I'm excited about this because what we're going to see now, as I was saying, if you just joined us, as a few people did just in the last few uh, minutes and you didn't catch the intro comment is some of the most iconic images or these are some of the most iconic painting images of painting ever created in the history of uh, painting and we're going to see them now and explain the facts about them as well as some of the myths that people often have okay let's start with this now I always give you guys a heads up so when you're taking your notes you want to make sure you it's your call, but I would recommend that you mark a special symbol or some kind of notation next to the notes for those slides that I tell you are the most important by saying I won't be cutting those slides, certain ones from the study list for the midterm. This is one of them. It's, it's so important. It's the birth of Venus, just like it sounds in the, you've never written the word Venus, same spelling as the planet, of course, V-E-N-U-S. Birth of Venus. The artist's name is Botticelli, and I'll say that slowly. Uh, it's B-O-T-T-I-C-E-L-L-I. -L -L -I. Botticelli, 1484. You, most of you, I'm sure, have seen this at some point in your lives because it's so famous, and there's a good reason for that, because it broke new ground. This is a seminal work of art. Uh, and it absolutely has, uh, it did, I mean, and at the time caused major controversy for the artist. Botticelli could have gotten in trouble for painting this scene. And we'll have to explain why that's the case in just a minute. But let's first of all say who was Venus, what's happening in this scene. So the first fact about the meaning is usually in a painting. What is the story it's telling? Certainly in Renaissance painting, that's the case. Well, it's an ancient Greek myth in which Venus, who is the ancient Greek and Roman, she, she had different names in the, the Greek and Roman language, but the same goddess. She was an ancient Greek and Roman goddess uh, who was the goddess of love and female beauty, among other things. She also had other powers. And so here she is, according to that ancient Greek myth, the Greeks created her, so it was a Greek myth, in which she was born out of a sea of Zeus's sperm. Yep, that's one controversy that the artist kind of made the, the liquid, the shell is floating on, not quite look like water would normally look, of course, in a, a sea or, or, or a lake. And there's a reason for that, because according to Greek myths, she was born Venus uh, uh, from a sea of Zeus was the head god, if you didn't know that, uh, of the Greeks. Yeah, so that's one controversy. Not everyone looking at this painting would have understood that, but educated people would have known that. Myth. Another is her nudity. This is the first really important fact, why this is a seminal work, and why I'm not cutting it from the study list. This painting is the first famous, you, you always have to say it that way, there could have been some we don't know about, but the first famous painting in Western art to show a nude female figure since ancient times. There's no other way to say that. And that's a major breakthrough because it was taking a big risk. Again, the first uh, famous painting to show a nude female figure. You can say nude adult female figure. Yeah, you should say adult because little baby angels, that was okay. So the first 
famous painting to show an adult nude female figure since ancient times. That's like a thousand years since the fall of Rome that the artists weren't allowed to do that. Okay, so what that caused was a controversy with the Catholic Church, of course, because they didn't like to see that. But e even as big, some say worse scandal was created by the very subject itself. So the next fact you should be mentioning in your notes is the other, one of the other controversies, there were several about this painting is that it is about a Greek myth and not a Christian religious theme. So he's breaking with the mainstream of Renaissance art, right? Which the Catholic church supported, of course, uh, and or at least didn't oppose. And he's presenting an ancient myth from pre-Christian times. They called them pagans, P-A-G-A-N. You might know that word, but you'll have to know that for the exam, but it's a good word to use to describe what some, not much today, but back then, Christians would call people who weren't, uh, weren't Christian pagan. And it was supposedly, you know, an insult uh, that they were somehow evil or ignorant or uh, ungodly. So this is a pagan myth from pre-Christian times. That right there would have been enough to get the artist in trouble. But when you add her nudity as an adult, you know, female figure and the sea of sperm, you've got a pretty toxic mix for the artists to have to answer questions about. Yes, he did. He had to actually explain this painting and come up with a rationale for why it wasn't considered too obscene, right? Or too, too morally objectionable to the Catholic Church because they had so much control. You know, this is Italy uh, before the, the uh, Reformation. There were no Protestants, right? So the Catholic Church controlled everything when it came to religious art so, or any kind of art. So the art, here's what the artist said, the last part of the meaning, and this is really important, is brings up our first definition. It's on your list. Um, Neoplatonic, it better be, yeah, I think, yeah, it is, there it is. Neo, it's near the bottom of the first page of your list of terms to know, okay? Here we go. Neoplatonic, that's one word, art. What, what is that? Well, this is one of the first famous Neoplatonic paintings, and that means it's a style of, Art. It didn't just painting, it also applied to sculpture and drawings. So we'll just say art, a style of art in which the main figures have a dual identity, colon or semicolon, one as ancient mythological figures and the other as Christian religious figures. I'll repeat that. Neoplatonic was a style of we should say Renaissance art, specifically it came from Renaissance, Renaissance art, in which the main figures had a dual identity, one as an ancient mythological figure and the other as a Christian religious figure. Well, that begs the question, where's the Christian religious figures in this painting? <laughs> Here's what the artist said, at least when the Catholic officials questioned him about this painting before they'd allow it to be seen say, in public. Okay, here we go. And this is the last part of the meeting, so you do want to write this. The three sets of figures here, he, he explained it this way. He said, okay, Venus is, of course, an ancient Greek goddess, but she's also the Virgin Mary. Okay, you're buying that one. Let's move on. How about these two wind gods? Again, those are pagan Greek ideas. He said they were angels from heaven, uh, you know, just accompanying Mary on a trip, something like that. And then this is my favorite. What's going on here? This is the ancient Greek goddess Primavera, or you can just say the goddess of spring, whose name was Primavera. You can just say the goddess of spring. Okay, that's the mythological uh, identity. So what is the Christian identity? Saint John the Baptist in drag. It's seriously, he proposed that that be the explanation. The Catholic Church accepted it and the painting went on display and it's been for five, 400 years almost. Well, almost by over 500 years, it's been on display in a museum where it's first was shown, same place, influence. He was able to convince the Catholic Church that, that he, he intended this. Some historians think he made that all that stuff up after the painting was brought into question, but no one knows that for sure. All we know is that his explanation was accepted by the Catholic Church and the local officials in Florence and the painting was allowed to be seen and it's been one of the most famous paintings in the world ever since. Okay, so that's the meaning on this. Now, formal analysis, I think some of you already noticed that I, I, when I saw this painting in the museum, I thought it would look different. In, well, of course it 
you know, it's always different to see the real thing in real life. But I mean, the colors I thought would be more vivid or, or more rich and saturated. No, he, he used pastel hues. So you could start by saying the colors here as they are obviously a mixture of the warm uh, flesh tones, skin tones, right? Uh, and, and the cool on the, you'll just say, you could say the water if you want, but it's actually the, sp the sperm here, the bluish color and the white of the seashell, as well as the white of the go gown here of the goddess spring slash John the Baptist. That's all obviously cool as are some of these robes on the wind gods. So a lot of it is, is cool in the background and then, um, you know, the shell and water, and whatever, the liquid in the foreground, but it's a mixture. Of course, that's, by now you guys should be able to start being able to see a painting and, and or any work of art that's got color and identify warm and cool colors. And it's warm also on her hair. But what I'm talking about is another aspect of color here the color is, you don't want to say faded. That, that sounds like something's wrong. It, it's deteriorated. No, this is the way it looked originally. Um, the artist used pastel hues of, hue, of warm and cool hues. Pastel hues of warm and cool colors, I should say, in almost all of his paintings, some of them less than others. But this one clearly has those kind of lighter tones compared to, again, it's not about cool or warm. We already covered that. Both types of color are visible here, but all of the main figures have a cool, I was actually cool, sorry, have a pastel hue to them. That's one of his signature motifs. And another is his landscapes. Let's go up close. That doesn't look very realistic. How about these trees? I, I always mention this. Anyone that's lived in an LA apartment building as I did for a while, plastic trees, fake trees out in front of some of the buildings in Los Angeles County. Uh, those trees don't look real. They look like they're made out of wax, as one critic put it. I don't know if that was at the time when people thought, but they, they, that's not like a normal tree with the bark, you know, clearly strong, realistic textures, similar textures. So he used simplified textures, simulated, of course, simplified simulated textures on this background in his landscapes. And then sharp, we're doing the form analysis now, sharp and realistic uh, textures, of course, on the skin, the seashell, the hair, the robes. Uh, and you could make the case on the sperm, I suppose, if you wanted to. Now, is it balanced? I think it's roughly balanced, because even though there's only one figure here, John the Baptist slash Goddess Spring, it's about equal to these two figures clinging to each other over on the other side and she's in the middle. I would call it roughly balanced, but some people say, oh, but even though those trees that might not be sharp and realistic, texture, they create mass. Okay. They create mass. And so of course you could say it's weighted towards the right, I would not think that. But it feels balanced to me roughly, at least in the three main figures that we see in the program. And then there's the rhythm, of course, of the, well, sperm, <laughs> wave, just say wave, you want to avoid that term if you prefer in your notes and then the seashell of course obviously all shells have rhythm and all the bodies so the arms legs hands feet heads uh, there's a lot of rhythm of course uh, it is mostly stable look carefully she's standing except from below the knee pretty upright the trees are upright uh, the goddess of spring is mostly standing upright but because of the seashell and the diagonal of the two uh, wind gods uh, you just probably say it's mixed. It's a mixture of, of stable dynamic. Now, the, uh, the largest mass, that's up to you. It might be John the Baptist slash spring over here because of the size of the robe. She's about to cover the nakedness you see of Venus with that robe. Maybe. I think it is slightly larger than these two figures because they overlap each other. And then she would be the third largest if you see it that way. There's only thin outline around the main figures. There's soft modeling, but it's realistic. So you don't want to just say it's soft and don't say fuzzy or diffused. No, the, the, the modeling and the cement texture are sharp and realistic, but the colors are, you know, you could even say muted, but uh, pastel hues. And the modeling is soft yet realistic on the seashell, on the skin, on the clothing, or the robes, and so forth. Uh, for space, we've got overlapping, obviously. Um, I don't know if I'd call this foreshortening on the seashell, but perhaps you see it that way, I wouldn't argue. And there is not really atmospheric perspective here. That's the blue of the water. It doesn't really have a hazy look over these hills here. See, there's a hazier here than they are here. 
So I don't see atmospheric perspective, but there probably is scientific. There's probably a vast report on the horizon. So diminishing size on the shore, overlapping, foreshortening maybe down here, and scientific perspective. Okay. Um, and let's see, I think we've covered rhythm, balance. Yeah, I think we have. All right, any questions before we move on? Because now we're going to get to even more famous paintings. And Mark, but this, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a question for you if you could go back a slide. Um, two things. And um, first, on the your comment about stable, maybe a little bit, but, bit dynamic. When I look at this, um, I, I would have thought it would have been, you know, somewhere between very to highly dynamic. And the reason I say that is, to me, it looks like the angels are flying in from the left. They are dynamic. And leaning, right. Totally dynamic. And then the goddess on the right, she's stepping right. forward with her arms up and throwing a towel around Venus to close her. Sure. And then even I, Venus I wouldn't is, dispute that. And you, if you wrote it that way, it's perfect. You're, you're explaining yourself very well. In your paper, you'd get full credit. I'm reacting to the fact that Venus is the main figure and two thirds of her body from about, you know, her hips up is straight upright. And the upper half of spring plus the trees behind her are straight. So to me, it's a mixture. But but on the other hand, making the case you did it a very good job. That would be very appropriate. That you feel it's more dynamic than stable, uh, for sure. I I wouldn't dispute that. Good point. And, okay. well, and again, uh, and I'm I'm certainly not trying to be. Um, no, uh, no, no, whatever, please. But, that's, yeah. That's, but, uh, my, my other my other um, okay point is uh, just kind of curious. I mean, a really famous painting, and it's all about Venus. Why do you suppose the artist made Venus, in essence, the third, uh, the third largest mass, the least, in, you know, I'll, I'll say to, And I don't know the answer to it, but if you want to do some research, I'm not sure if you find to write a paper or do extra credit even on this. Uh, there's probably documentaries about, I'm sure there are, about this painting. It's so famous uh, and the history behind it. Um, I don't know the answer to that. It's a good point. But she still dominates because she's in the middle and uh, the model for it was a well-known upper class. Well, some so we don't know, but there was some evidence that it was an upper class woman who wouldn't have been shamed, right? Because you were looked down on if you were a female model, unless you were from an upper class and you did it as a portrait. But she's in the nude, see? So maybe she would have denied it even if it was some upper class woman who, who was, you know, not prevented by her family from posing for the artist, who knows? In any case, I think her expression has become iconic. I mean, whatever you want to say about it. I mean, you know, female beauty, or if you just want to say a kind of, you know, winsome expression of, you know, she just being born out of nothing, right? Like a newborn baby, and you know, so it's kind of has a, a very subtle, but strong emotional component on her face and her pose both. Cause you see, she's kind of self-conscious of covering one of her breasts. So that's why people notice her, even though she's the smallest figure. But but you're right; it's usually more often for the main figure to be the largest. Okay, we need to move on. But I'm going to give you a quick sidebar. This is not a must know, but I'll bet a few of you will find this an interesting topic for extra credit, perhaps, or even maybe for a paper. Uh, the um, museum in Boston, and I'm going to have to search my memory bank. There was a robbery in Boston in 1990 of one of the largest private collections of paintings in the United States. It had dozens of world-class Renaissance and Baroque paintings from the, the 14th through the 1600s, Rembrandt's, Van Dyck's, and yes, it had a Botticelli and it's gone. 18 of those paintings, including three of the Rembrandts. Gardner, there I got it. The Gardner Museum in Boston, it's a world famous FBI open case. It's not a cold case, but they can't pin down who stole them. Somehow it was an inside job. One night, a bunch of uh, thieves took the 18, they knew what they were doing, the most valuable as per their appraisal by the museum, the 18 most valuable paintings out of their frames. Supposedly, hopefully it didn't damage them. Obviously they would have rolled them up because you can't transfer them easily in a frame. Some of them are life-size like figures. There were portraits, all kinds of things. This was included. It's called the Madonna of the Eucharist by Bo Botticelli. It's not a must know, obviously, it's not in your syllabus. But here you see the colors aren't quite as pastel, but they still are if you look closely enough on the skin tones. And, uh, and there you have your simplified, right, uh, background, right, 
or style in these, if you want to say, you have to write this. So what happened to those 18 paintings? Nobody knows, but every couple of years, the FBI gets an anonymous tip because it's a federal crime. Art theft is a federal crime, not a state or local crime. And there'll, there'll be a tip. Of, I know where some of the gardener paintings are at a warehouse, show up at so-and-so, and, and then it turns out, you know, the person that they're supposedly going to sell them to from the museum has, of course, an FBI, you know, watch team with him hiding or something and they arrest the person that pretend and it turns out they're fakes. They've never recovered a single one. It's the largest art theft in the history of the modern world in value. It'd be worth over a billion dollars now, those paintings. Gardner Museum of Art, 1990, Boston, you could look it up. Andrea, it should, should be a good movie topic, but no one's made a film of it yet. It wouldn't have a conclusion yet. But, okay, this is the next must know. And this, this painting has personal meaning and I bet it will for a few of you, if you've experienced anything like what this painting is implying, but it's not obvious at first glance. Okay, it's a next must know, old man and his grandchild. Okay, old man and his grandchild, one word. The artist's name, another multi-syllable Italian last name, sorry, I'll spell it slowly. Ghirlandau, that's G, G, as in, you know, Good. G H I R L A N D A I O is pronounced Girlandau, 1480. This is a secular painting. So that's your second definition. That's a very short definition. It's on your first page of your list of terms and that's secular. And that would be, it, it's not just about art, but when it's in art, it applies to a work of art. So I'll just give you the, the basic definition of that word. Secular, having to do with everyday life or non-religious topics. Having to do with everyday life or non-religious topics. You could say themes if you prefer, topics or themes, period. This is a secular painting. It's one of the first famous secular paintings in the Renaissance. And the artist was ahead of his time because of that fact alone, but also the human emotions he captured. Now, I've had people look at this when I you know, taught with it on the big screen and it's 50 people in the Annerley Hall classroom, right? And say, I'd ask them, what do you think's going on? What do you think this little, boy? by the way, it's a little boy. We know who these people are. So I don't know why Stockstead doesn't just say like everybody else that <laughs> writes about this painting says, old man and grandson. We know who they were. We don't have to guess. Girlandau was so famous because why? Why was Girlandau famous? Well, not just for doing some of the first secular themed paintings in the Renaissance, that would alone make him important, but he was the teacher of both da Vinci and Michelangelo. So he might not have had either of those two artists' careers or at least be as successful and talented as they were if they hadn't been taught by this man. It's a pretty important person that you probably never heard of him, I'm sure. Wow. Yeah, he was again, the teacher of both da Vinci and Michelangelo. Uh, he was one of the most famous painters during his lifetime, but he was older than either of them. So of course he didn't live very long after they became famous. Well, first da Vinci was 20 years old. But they both as young students studied under Gillendale. But what's really important is the theme of this painting. It, yes, it's secular, but what's going on here? So let's see. I think in the next few, these are my own slides. It's in the loo, by the way. Take a look now at this close up. Look at the expression. Now we'll just say the little boy, the grandson. What is he, maybe five years old, possibly even younger. And look at the grandfather and look at how the, their expressions are locked on each other. And what do you think the little boy is thinking about? Anybody? Asking, he yeah, asking that, for something? Well, that's a good guess. Actually, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, well, we know enough about them to know what it was. So that actually isn't it, but that's not a bad guess. I mean, it could be. I love, that's what a lot of people want. Admiration? Close. You're in the ballpark. Yeah. Oh. All right. Let me give you a clue. You notice there's something wrong with the grandfather's nose. Yeah. Is he looking at it because he's interested in what it is? Or Well, that is another excellent guess. It, it, probably the first time he visited his grandfather, he He's fearful have. of his death. Yes, his grandfather has cancer of the nose. He died not long after this painting was done. And the little boy is, well, look at his hand. To me, that's the final gesture. Okay, let me, let me rephrase the question. When you know someone you love, right? 
is maybe not going to be around a lot longer. Unfortunately, all of us have that to deal with at some point in our lives, don't we? Um, and you get to see them, at least you're not sure if it might be the last time. Even as a young child, you might feel uh, an emotion that's one of the positive things that makes us all human. <laughs> and almost everyone has felt for some other member of their family at a time like this. Um, anybody want to put a, a, you know, a name on that kind of emotion? Because there is a phrase that fits best, but there's no right or wrong phrase. What would you describe as a feeling you might have, or if you witnessed this scene, let's say you were the father of the little boy, that is the emotion between the two of them that they are feeling for each other. Anybody? <laughs> Surely somebody can say something. Okay. Somber. Say it again. Somber. Um, well, that, that would be it. Probably again, the first time he visited his grandfather and found out he wasn't well and might not live very long. But let's say he got past that. And he's re he's greeting his grandfather on maybe what will be the last week. Well, look melancholy. at his eyes. Say it again. Melancholy. Is he melancholy? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Could be, but that that's not what I'm thinking of. It's something more basic that we all need, and hopefully every family shares at some point between some of our you know closest relatives that we don't know how soon we may see again, or even if we ever will. Sadness. Uh, yeah. Well, this is interesting. Hmm. This is interesting because, yeah. Well, it's it's a more positive human emotion that that if you didn't have it, uh, a family can't really quite function very well without it. <laughs> okay. Unconditional love. There's no question that the artist intended that little boy feels for his grandfather and vice versa, because they both know it might be the last time they see each other. And the little boy may be a little young to think that way, but not really because it's an instinctual emotion if he's obviously very close and affectionate with his grandfather, probably visits them. You know, he could tell they're out in the country, right? So he was from Florence, the same area that Gerald Dow lived in, where all the great artists were lived and painted during the early Renaissance. And so at some point, this family commissioned that painter to come with them to see this reunion, perhaps the last time the little boy would see his grandfather and the little boy would have been quite aware. So I'll say it again. The emotion portrayed here has nothing to do with religion. It's called um, unconditional love. And that is something I hope all of us <laughs> have, you know, in our families occasionally or among friends, even, right, close friends especially if it's a situation where you, you somehow are aware that you may never see the person again, or at least not for a long time. So it's a universal human emotion, in other words, that he's captured here and has nothing to do with religion per se. It has to do with uh, daily life, right? And it, that makes it a secular thing. Let's go back to the broader view and do a formal analysis because that's the whole meaning here. Uh, you can see I, I captured the frame here. It's kind of hard at, at certain angles in the middle of, of a museum with half a million or something like a quarter of a million people a day go to that museum in, in uh, the Louvre in Paris. So I had to wait till no one was bumping into my elbows. So you see the uh, background right behind their heads. Guess what that should remind you of? I bet a couple of you guess a, a painting we're gonna be seeing in a few more slides. That's behind an even more, much more famous image painted a little later during the Renaissance by another painter. Okay, the Mona Lisa, right? It should, there's no accident, in, it's not a coincidence. That's the style of landscaping da Vinci employed because he learned it from Gerland Dow, which is not accurate and realistic per se, but neither is it you know, um, unrealistic. It has all the right details of the trees, you know, and the color of the um, dark, and it's a brown earth there in Tuscany, Northern Italy, where this was, and then you see, the mountain has the blue hazy, right? Atmospheric perspective. Things, this, there's no question here. This had scientific perspective, the landscape. There'd be a bastion point behind the mountain. So that's all done realistically, the texture, the modeling and, and the space uh, techniques. But, but it is an imaginary or stylized version of what they might've seen outside the window. Um, <clears throat> so, that technique of using an imaginary landscape, but with realistic techniques behind the main figures is very famous in da Vinci painting. Almost every painting he did had that. He learned it from this guy. 
Kier Lindau. Okay, so let's do the rest of the formal analysis. Oh, obviously there's overlapping and foreshortening. The window sill has foreshortening his uh, grandfather's shoulders. The simulated texture I already said is quite realistic, including on his cancerous nose. I'm actually pleasantly um, impressed that no one here said, oh, the little boy's looking at his grandfather's ugly nose and doesn't like it. No one said that, but the first time I showed the slide, I had people guessing that was, no, that is not what the little boy's thinking about. He loves his grandfather too much for that. Maybe the first time he saw that, but, you know, it, they didn't know how to treat cancer then. Well, they, they could sometimes, you know, remove it if it was obvious, but it was too far gone for this man to survive it. So I don't think he lived long enough to see that kid, that child again. All right, the uh, modeling, very strong and realistic. Again, as you would expect, all Renaissance things are on the hand, the little boy, the, both their faces, the grandfather's robes, uh, and I already said on the landscaping. The rhythm is obvious too, of course, the folds in the grandfather's robe, uh, the features of you know their faces, uh, the two eyes here, of course, and uh, their hair, that creates rhythm, and so does the uh details on the landscaping is it stable or dynamic now this one i'm going to stick to what i think is pretty straightforward it's mostly stable the windowsill has a right angle the little boy's head is look at the the angle of his shoulders up through the hair and through the forehead it's pretty much a straight upright angle i mean his arm is slightly dynamic but the grandfather is also sitting upright and his head is mostly straight so it's more stable than dynamic but clearly the tops of their heads or the little boy's hat and grandfather's head those are dynamic as are some of the details in the landscaping the mountain and the road the largest mass easy the grandfather then you could say the wall if you want to count that and then the little boy um Let's see, uh, color is warm mostly because it's human beings with skin tones. Although his hair is cool, right? Cool gray. Little boys is blonde, obviously that's warm. And they're both wearing orange tops, aren't they? Orange with uh, vests or robes. Uh, but the wall behind them is cool gray. And the landscaping is a mixture, of course, of warm in the foreground and cool in the distance. And everything has thin outline around it. And is it balanced? I'm going to argue that it's roughly balanced, but I could see how you could make the case that it's unbalanced toward the left. I wouldn't argue with that. But the area covered by the grandfather's head and the little boy's head and shoulders is roughly equal. And if you do the line down the middle, they're on either side, kind of if you use this as a diagonal. And then you use this area here, the little boy's hand and his grandfather's chest and the window area, right? From the, that, 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 I'm sure the artist thought of this. So he's kind of giving it a rough or subtle, he could say subtle balance. But at first glance, it has more to most people of an appearance of being unbalanced toward the left. Okay, let's move on to even more famous works. This is another one, by the way, of Gierland and Dallas, but I'll go over it quickly because we need to keep moving We're behind, where uh, two of the figures, Mary and her cousin from the Bible, uh, her cousin got pregnant at 70 or something like that. This is long before in vitro. Uh, according to the Bible, it's a miracle. And uh, it just shows that he was, you know, always using these, you know, sharp modeling and simulated textures and then his imaginary landscape, that one's a cityscape. Uh, Mr. Wilson, did yes. you say that piece was mostly balanced, considered mostly balanced? I or? think so, yes, yes. And I, I don't want to dispute that because if you see it differently, I accept it because of the way that the diagonal line from left to right corners and right to left, top to bottom. The artist thought about that. I mean, we know because he left, uh, right, he wrote about art. Uh, Gerard Dow was also an art critic and art uh, teacher. I mean, of course, he was a teacher, but he also was a lecturer. He was famous in his day all over Italy and maybe other parts of Europe too. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, this is recording, right? I mean, I double checked, right? Anybody want to confirm 100%? I hit record, so it should be. Yeah, it's it is recording. recording. Thank you guys. Okay, now this one I'm gonna go quickly because we're running short. What time is it now? Let's see, there it is. Yeah, we really have a lot to cover and I don't want. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that I'm gonna cross it off the list, but I'll just tell you what, so you don't have to do a formal analysis. Cross Gijorni, Gijorne, sorry. It's the third one from the bottom, The Tempest, The Tempest. It's a fascinating painting. I love covering it, but we're running behind here. And it's not anything bad because these are good questions you guys are asking. I don't wanna discourage, but we do have to keep moving. We don't wanna to get too far behind by the fourth or fifth week. We're a week behind, that's not good. 
Okay, this is a painting by uh, an artist who was known for his mystery painting. Some some critics called him. You don't have to write this unless you might want to write a paper about it or, so, or just do or your own research. No one knows the exact meaning of this painting. Some think it's a Mary with baby Jesus and her husband, right, Joseph, on the road to Egypt, escaping from Jerusalem, from Israel, because the king of Israel was going to, you know, uh, murder all the firstborn children. That's in the Bible. But there's a problem with that. First of all, Joseph was 25 years old. <laughs> And he wasn't a soldier. This guy's a soldier. He's got a weapon. He would only have that kind of a weapon if he was a soldier, although he's not in armor. And I don't think Mary was ever portrayed this way. She even looked like she might be pregnant with the second child. Nobody knows for sure who these figures are. And nor does this look, well, th that doesn't prove anything. Jerusalem, one of the painters, very few had ever been outside of uh, Europe, certainly outside of the, uh, in the Middle East. So we don't know if they had any idea what Jerusalem looked like. Uh, it looks more like an Italian city, but the storm, the title gives us a hint, is the focus. There's some kind of judgment from God, most historians agree, that the painter's conveying. Perhaps the city is full of corrupt, sinful behavior and scandal and all that, and this is a couple escaping from it. Or it could be a woman who's just somehow strangely <laughs> nearly in the nude with a nearly newborn or an infant anyway um, uh, that she has to take care of. And not, you know, no, right, no shoes. No, I mean, nobody can explain those things. And some guy just is wandering along the road and he decides to stop and see what's going on or even to kind of stay there and protect her until she's ready to move on. Nobody knows. It's a mystery painting, but it's fascinating. But the lightning over the city is, is a commonly accepted theme in um, uh, painting in the Renaissance of God's judgment against somebody or some place. And here it looks like this whole city. It looks much like an Italian walled city. There were so many of them. We don't know for sure. Okay, uh, we covered this. We covered this. Remember I cut this? Everybody remembers that? I cut that, but not this. <laughs> this and the next one are the two most important paintings we're going to see tonight. Well, well the three that they are equally important. That is Birth of Venus. Uh, this, of course, is Mona Lisa. I don't have to spell it. Mona Lisa da Vinci. I don't have to spell it. <laughs> 1504. Okay, so what do we know about this painting? We know that this was the fiance, you know, soon to be wed woman named uh, Lisa Giaconda. There's no debating these facts. We have receipts and written records to prove how this painting was commissioned by a man named Giacondo. That's it's Italian, so don't worry too much about it. It's phonetic. G I A N C O N D O is the male, and the wife, as soon as she married him, her last name would become Giaconda. In Europe, if you want to go see this in the Louvre, they know American tourists are going to call it Mona Lisa. That's not the right title. I don't know how, but in America, it got a new title. In Europe, it's called La Giaconda, meaning the wife of Giacondo. That would be her married name. But she wasn't married yet. We know that this was commissioned as a probably a wedding present, you know, uh, because she was engaged to this wealthy Italian merchant who we know commissioned or hired da Vinci to paint her portrait, probably as a wedding gift. What are, what are the reasons would there be? But there the facts become less clear. What we also know, though, that there's no dispute is that the uh, future husband refused the painting. Fool. <laughs> he refused to accept the painting. He didn't like it for some reason. It's the most famous painting probably uh, in the history of the human race. I mean, everyone's seen this tragedy. I've seen images of it in rural China <laughs> and, and, you know, the deserts of Egypt, even people had icons of this. Um, why did he reject it? That's where the mystery begins. No one knows. So I will tell you the th leading theories. I don't have time for all of them. There have been whole books and documentaries done on this for decades. But what the leading theories are is that the first thing is perhaps she had been having an affair with someone other than her fiance. And that's why she's smiling. So they all center the, the myths, the theories around why is she smiling. Another and it's even in that song by Nat King Cole. I don't know if you ever heard the best version. So many people saying that song, but the best version is Nat King Cole's Mona Lisa. Literally. Maybe you're smiling to hide a broken heart. There's some evidence that she might have had a miscarriage, but I don't think there's any proof of that and lost, you know, perhaps a child 
or that she wanted to marry someone else. That's even more likely because arranged marriages were the norm, especially in the middle, upper middle and upper classes. And she was from probably middle class marrying into an upper class. So she might have had little or no choice. She could have been married just for marrying I and mean, just for security, uh, you know, or even her family could have arranged it. So maybe she was unhappy. Uh, she had had to break off a, you know, a love, a romantic relationship with someone she really loved to marry uh, someone she had felt she had to marry. That's a, a likely explanation, but again, no proof. No letters or anything yet have surfaced to verify any of these theories. Uh, yet another one, there's two more, we'll go over and then we'll talk about the techniques, is that uh, she had ha was having an affair with Da Vinci and um, the uh, husband-to-be found out <laughs> and got mad. Well, there's a problem with that. Da Vinci was gay. And he had many, many female friends he respected, admired, and even was emotionally close to, wrote letters to, but she wasn't one of them. And there is no evidence that he had any kind of uh, heterosexual relationships, intimate relationships. We don't know for sure, but I doubt that. And then my favorite, that really seems like it's a complete out there, you know, out the outer edge of Rebelli's, that it is a self-portrait of da Vinci in drag. <laughs> And the only reason that there's an actual book about this, and it's ridiculous because it's based on the thinnest evidence, is that it's an overpainting over an actual self-portrait made years earlier of da Vinci himself on the same piece of wood. It's on wood, by the way. Well, the explanation, no, wait a minute. Let me think about it. Uh, no, it's on canvas. It's on canvas. I misspoke. Uh, yeah, it's at the Louvre and it's tiny. It's a tiny paint painting. You could easily get it under your arm. <laughs> No, you couldn't because of the security. But anyway, it, it was stolen. We'll, we'll end the meaning notes with what happened when it was stolen about 100 years ago. Obviously, it was returned. So here we are. The last thing that theory is with poppycock, as the Brits would say. It's ridiculous because he did that a lot. He was never wealthy. Well, he got a little, sometimes he made enough money to feel comfortable for a couple of years. But da Vinci didn't care about money. That wasn't what mattered to him. He much more cared about knowledge, science you know, learning, and of course, all forms of art, including architecture. He also designed buildings, you know, I don't know if you knew that, as well as uh, did drawings and uh, some sculpture even. So the fact that he reused an old piece of canvas because he was short on money and that's a, he is not the only one that did it. A lot of famous Spaniards did that, in the especially poorer ones. Um, that, that doesn't prove anything. So we just don't know why she's giving. Maybe she's happy. You know, it could be the simplest explanation. She's going to be a rich guy that maybe she actually does like or love. And, and she's looking forward to the future. We, we just don't know why exactly. But the other mystery is why didn't the commissioner accept the painting? You know, the, the, the one that had commissioned it, uh, Gio Condo. There's no explanation. The last fact's about the meaning now, and then we'll do a formal analysis which is going to take a while because there's several new techniques in this painting that Da Vinci invented two, two ones. And they're both on your list of terms. Before we get to the formal analysis, the last thing about the meaning is what happened to it? This painting, this board ended up in the Louvre. There was no Louvre in 1504. He kept it with him his entire life and traveled all over Europe with that painting. He was famous enough to be invited to live with princes and even kings and other parts of you know local royalty and other parts of Europe mostly we talk about France and uh, I'm not sure what other countries I think Belgium and definitely all over Italy so just say in a number of parts of Europe he was invited uh, as a house guest by royalty in different parts of uh, Western Europe not, not Eastern. and he had the painting with him every way so guess where the last place he lived where he actually died was in the palace of the king of France and in his will he to, he uh, uh, willed the painting to the king of France. And that's how it ended up in the Louvre. There was no Louvre then. The Louvre was, the, well, it was, but it was the palace of the kings. It wasn't an art museum. So once it became an art museum, 300 years later, that was where this painting ends up. That's how it's now at the Louvre in Paris. I guess I should say that the theft part of it. In 1912, I think it was, I have that year right. A couple of Belgian, we know they were from Belgium, Belgian uh, thieves managed to sneak into the Louvre after hours and cut the painting out of its frame and steal it. Good grief, where were the body, the night guards, you know, the <laughs> security people? 
Anyway, yeah, well, there's a bit of security, but 1912 at any big museum, let alone the most famous in the world. So they, he, they got away with this, two, two men, I think it was, collaborating. And they were caught somewhere in Belgium about a year later, and the painting had been damaged. It was rolled up and stored, I think, uh, behind the wall, under plaster or something like that, anyway, in their house or their wherever they were staying, the apartment. And it was returned, but it needed to be restored, but not badly. It just had a few cracks, you know, maybe a scuff mark too. So it was restored carefully by experts, and it hasn't had to be uh, touched since then. It's under glass with security you wouldn't believe. <laughs> every kind of security you could imagine. It's, it's valued at somewhere between a quarter of a million and a half billion dollars the last time I looked it up, but no one's ever gonna sell it. <laughs> okay, that's so many facts, you wouldn't need to use more if it's on the uh, midterm, which has a high possibility of being on the midterm. You'd wanna mention six of those in a paragraph. That's how the test, we will talk about how to set up your test in about four weeks. It's not till the eighth week. All right, let's do the formal analysis. Okay, take out your right um, list of terms to know. And here we have sfumato. This painting uses two new techniques. One is sfumato, S-F-U-M-A-T-O. S-F-U-M-A-T. Well, it's, I shouldn't have to spell it. It's on your, your handouts, right? So here we go. That, that is a new technique for, just the A technique. So keep simple. A technique for painting. And you can say probably invented by da Vinci in the second technique we know he invented because everyone gave credit, but so we don't know for sure. I'll repeat the first part of that definition again. A sfumato is a technique for painting probably invented by da Vinci, comma, in which the artist uses a light wash over part, you see where it is, over part or all of the painting to give it a smoky, hazy effect. Again, in which the artist uses a light wash over part or all of the painting to give it a smoky, hazy effect. The entire landscape has sfumato. She doesn't. He didn't want to obscure her in a smoky, hazy look. He wants us to focus on her, but he doesn't want the landscape to, to compete with our attention on her. You can see that if it's not obvious, let's get up close. You see what I mean? There's, there's a, a wash, and I'm not sure what the materials are. Back in the Renaissance, they had different kinds of washes that, that painters would have today. They were probably all toxic chemicals. In any case, this has sfumato, and it's one of the first paintings. You can't say it's the very first. That's why we can't claim with certainty that da Vinci invented it, but he's the first famous painter to use it. That we can say, first famous painter in uh, Renaissance history to use that technique, the sumato. It, it affects the modeling. We'll get to the formal specific nine elements in just a couple minutes. So what's the other technique that's used here, which is part of the composition? This is the second word down on the second page, right? You see below sumato on your list of terms, chiaroscuro. I guess I'll, well, it's written there for you. So yeah, you're, you should be just writing it below. So I shouldn't have to spell that one. Chiaroscuro is a technique for painting invented by da Vinci. See, no debate on that. A technique for painting invented by da Vinci, comma. So not just him, every artist can, any artist can use it. In which the artist, whoever they may be, uses contrasting areas of light or sharply, I meant to say, uh, sharply contrasting areas, sorry, I'll say strongly is a better word because sharp is a, is a relative term. Strongly contrasting areas of light and dark, like under her chin, or let's go to her hands. I'll say it again. It, it's a technique in which the artist uses strongly contrasting areas of light and dark main, around the main figures in a painting to give them a three-dimensional look. It's a kind of modeling. It absolutely is. In fact, it is a form of modeling. It's not, it's, it's not even uh, open to question. It, it's a more realistic looking type of modeling than any artist had used before Da Vinci came up with it. So once again, I'll repeat that. It's a technique for painting invented by Da Vinci, comma, in which the artist uses 
uh, you can say highly or uh, strongly, either word will do, contrasting areas of light and dark to create the impression of three dimensions. It's most visible around her face, right? Her whole chin, especially, and uh, her hands, especially this hand. Um, he, he invented that technique and then he used it more and more as his career. You'll see a couple of others where you don't have to take any notes after this, before we get to the last must know for days, the last supper by Vinci. Uh, you'll see what I mean. As he got older, he used that technique more and more and even stronger and, you know, more, you know, uh, clear cut, de um, you know, delineations between the dark, you know, uses of uh, areas of dark and light, contrasting areas, and his paintings. Well, why don't I just go ahead and show you? Let's see. See around her face, you see it around her hands. Yeah, I meant to forward to that. Yeah, forgot I had these details. You see it very clear, right? Even around her eyes and a little bit on her lips and nose, right? That's for, uh, that's, that's Carol School. Scobato is in the background, of it. And then look here, this is not a muscle, you have to write this. Another painting he did about the same time, about a year later, you know, 1505 or so. And it's um, the Madonna of the Rocks, you know, the rocks like that. Look at that, that is Chiaroscuro, as is also around all of the four main figures. It's Jesus and his cousin, John, who became the first Christian John the Baptist and uh, their aunt. And he used it a little less here because it's a daytime scene, but it's still present around the bodies of the main, and, and that's supposed to be it, Jesus. And then finally, this one, I love this painting. He was very close friends, this, this one, Da Vinci, with this woman. Again, purely a platonic uh, friendship. And that chiaroscuro, it just screams out. I mean, it's an actual black background. No other painter had thought to do that before him. So he invented that technique. We don't have to guess. Okay, let's talk about uh, the other elements of composition. Well, for space, you've got full shortening on her shoulders, and this is the balcony she's sitting on. And then, of course, overlapping everywhere, hands, clothes, right, hair. Uh, and then the background, of course, does have atmospheric perspective and scientific perspective, as well as diminishing size. So it's got those five main techniques that almost all Renaissance and landscape or outdoor paintings had. Now, this is a portrait, but it also incorporates a landscape. As I mentioned, he learned that idea from Gerland Dow <clears throat> to always set his portraits in some kind of, or usually, not always, but usually, uh, with some kind of background landscape, right? Okay, what else can we say? The color's almost entirely warm on her. In fact, I don't see a thing at all cool on her or her clothing. A little bit of warm colors on the road in the foreground or behind the belt, just behind it below the balcony, but the further back you go, certainly past the lake, the landscape becomes mostly cool. You know, grays and blues and so forth. Uh, there is soft but realistic modeling around her face and her hands. <clears throat> and I would, uh, uh, I would say strong and realistic modeling on her clothing. At least parts of her clothing, the parts we see. And the landscape, it's soft modeling again because of the stomata. And then yet realistic, everywhere the body is realistic. There's only thin outline. He didn't use bold outline much. I don't think I can think of an example where he did. This is all thin outline around all the objects. The rhythm is obvious with the road in the background, the mountains, um, you know, her arms and hands, her face, lots of rhythm. It is stable mostly on her. Look at the way she's sitting, pretty much straight upright. And this arm is, you know, even this one's almost, um, horizontal. This one definitely is by uh, the balcony behind her. So the foreground is mostly stable and the background is mostly dynamic, pretty straightforward on this. The largest mass, easy, her, and then it depends on whether you make the landscape the sea. I mean, the landscape is a single mass. If so, then that's the second largest mass. Uh, otherwise, I'd say it's the balcony is the second largest and then maybe the road, if you think of that as a separate or even the, the, the closest mountains here. Okay, uh, are we feeling rhythm, dynamics? Oh, is it balanced? Unbalanced toward the bottom, obviously, because of the sky above the upper part. Uh, and, you know, her head and neck are narrower than her lower body. But it is roughly balanced left to right. I mean, you could argue a little bit one way or the other. Well, there are more mountains on this side than this, but 
that's pretty minor compared to the overall effect of the curve sitting in the middle. Okay, we're doing pretty well on time because we have about the right amount of time to end on time to, let me just pause for a second. To not rush through the last must know it, it's also what I'm not cutting from the study list. And you should know uh, the name of it if you don't already. It's The Last Supper. The Last Supper. And of course, it's Da Vinci. And this one's 1498. Now, I didn't say when we started the definition for high renaissance. I kind of said it last week, but I don't think I gave it to you as a separate definition. It's a pretty short definition, but it's an important one. All of the paintings we're seeing today are high Renaissance. The Ghirlandau, Botticelli, Da Vinci. Now, what does that mean? It's a period during the Italian Renaissance from about 1480 to 1520, comma, it's two lines. It's a period during the Italian Renaissance from about 1480 to 1520, comma, during which the most famous artists of the Renaissance created their best and most innovative work, during which the most famous artists of the Renaissance created their best and most innovative work. Okay, that includes most of da Vinci's work, most of Michelangelo's. We're gonna next week, we're gonna see Raphael, he's another one of the high Renaissance painters, and, and Botticelli's later work, he started out before that period, but beginning after 1480, he became really famous. So, so these are high Renaissance artists and these works, all these slides today are high Renaissance. Okay, what is this about? Well, you may already know, but if you don't, you should write this. It's a scene from the Bible in which Jesus met with his disciples for the last time. That's why it's called the Last Supper, right? Uh, and it was just before the Romans arrested him and tried him for treason and executed him, of course, a week later. I think he had a week to live, in other words. Uh, so it's a moment of tragic. And it's well documented. This, this event happened. The Romans kept records on everything. We don't have to guess. We even know where some of these events took place because the Romans were really good at keeping all kinds of court records, military records, historic documents and uh, written histories of their own provinces. And of course, this was in Israel, but it's today, the country of Israel. So anyway, there he is in the middle. That should be obvious. That's Jesus. And he's saying goodbye. But there's a lot more going on here. Let's look over at these individual figures. Who are they? All right. This is Peter, his first and oldest disciple, the first one to join Jesus like years earlier when he first started preaching uh, Jesus. And his hands are raised up in a gesture of shock and disbelief. That would be the phrase I'd use or one of those two words in your notes. He's reacting with shock and disbelief. No, it can't be. None of us would betray you because Jesus, I actually, I shouldn't have said this. It's a, it's a moment at which Jesus says, I will soon be betrayed by one of you. I'll be arrested. The Romans will be taking you away. So I'm saying goodbye. I mean, obviously, he didn't use that language. He's more eloquent than he is probably in Hebrew, right? So the point is that they just learned that A, he knows he's about to be arrested. And B, he knows one of these 12 people was the one who betrayed him to the Romans. So, of course, they're reacting with shock and disbelief. You can see that in this disciple's face. And this man say, what did he say? I don't believe it. It can't be true. And then this is uh, one of the mysteries here. Who is this? Was she sure or he? We don't know if it's a man, a woman, or otherwise unclear. Um, a female disciple would only could be one. That's Mary, not his mother, obviously. The other Mary, Mary Magdalene. Don't ask me to spell that last name. She's a well-known figure in the Bible and in history. She was the only female disciple to follow Jesus. And she would have been on his right hand. But there are historians who absolutely refuse that or reject that explanation and say it's one of the younger men who did, they just, a lot of them had long hair back then. So he might have been someone named uh, James, right, or Michael. They had several, actually a couple of disciples had the same first name. So just say we don't know. But I personally and many, just say many historians believe it is Mary Magdalene. Spell it how it sounds. 
Mary Magdalene was always, according to the Bible, on the right hand. And you see she would be sitting if that's her, on the right hand of Jesus. That alone made this painting controversial because including her in any of the later paintings, the Catholic Church disowned her, basically. I mean, I don't want to quite put it that way, but it's close. They cut her section of the Bible out when they when the first Bibles were written. You can't say printed, they were hand printed. Uh, there was no book of Mary, like there's a book of Mark, right? The book of J you know, you know, John, um, Matthew and Luke, right? Four books describing four disciples' versions of how Jesus you know lived and died. And Mary wrote one, but hers was kept out of the Bible. So that right there would be da Vinci saying, in essence, challenging the Catholic Church, saying this wrong. He should have included her, and I'm putting her in the painting. We can't prove that, though. So that's just a leading theory. What we can say for sure, besides the shock and disbelief of all the figures, is that this man here is Judas. And he is the only one not reacting with shock and disbelief. Look at his body language. And he has a bag, which actually in his hand includes the silver coins the Romans gave him. I think I have a closer view. Let me see, do I have it? Yeah, these are my own slides I took at the, um, it, by the way, I forgot to say this, it's part of the meeting. <laughs> it's huge. It's larger than life. And it's on the wall of a monastery in Milan, Italy. It's still there, but it's faded so badly. It's had to be restored many times since it was finished because of the moisture and deterioration. Luckily, World War II bombs didn't destroy it. It's amazing, actually. So it survived the you know, wars and floods, and they've had plenty, even earthquakes in Italy. It's the original painting on the original wall. It's a fresco, a very large fresco, larger than life. It takes up one whole wall, but it has had to be restored. So some of the painting looks more faded because he didn't want to guess if the colors Da Vinci would have used that if you curious why. And here's the other half. These are my own slides that I took when I was standing in front of it. I got a private audience for 15 minutes because I knew one of the tour guides from that uh, city of Milan. I think that's it. Let's see. And then I'm going to tell you the thing about, oh, whoops, that's next week. Go back to the full view. The thing about uh, the, the skin tone of uh, Judas. Judas is the traitor here, right? Obviously, the villain, the evil one. He's betrayed his you know, beloved master, teacher, they were going to call him master, because his teacher, right? Uh, Jesus, his friend and teacher for, for money. And there are historians who claim that because he's the only one with a darker skin tone, that that's racist. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And I will verify that. Here's why. First of all, we know what da Vinci's thoughts and feelings were about racism and prejudice of every kind, including sexual discrimination. He actually, centuries before most right, people in the Western world, recognized this wrong morally and, and intellectually of any kind of discrimination. He wrote in his notebooks that prejudices of every kind are a stupid waste of human potential. And it was the exact phrase, but that's the gist of what he said. And he studied different uh, races and, and ethnic groups in his notebooks. You know, he wrote about everything under the sun. It's, people are still studying some of his notebooks and finding new ideas that they hadn't noticed before. The man was literally on fire. I think he had an IQ of like 200, some say 210. I mean, probably one of the highest in the history of human race. No, he had no prejudices. And another reason we know, it isn't the main reason, is that that was a uh, commonly used dramatic device going back to ancient Greek and Roman plays on stage, we're talking about, in which the villains were always shown, at, you know, in a darker light until, you know, they delivered their lines on stage and then they would go back off into the shadows. It's an artistic or dramatic device. It has nothing to do with race or ethnic, plus which they were all actually not light-skinned, they were all actually, right, Middle Eastern, <clears throat> and therefore they would have had some more swarthy skin. But of course, that would have been something the Catholic Church wasn't ready to even begin to accept. So it wasn't about race. It, it, was, it was a dramatic uh, technique. Okay, one last thing about the meaning. It's not a, a minor detail. This painting uses uh, da Vinci's new technique that was copied later by many other artists. So he's the one who invented this, which is to combine body language 
or you could say poses or body language with facial expressions to convey the inner thoughts and feelings of his main figures. He did that throughout his career, but this is the first famous painting in which that was done. You can see that in the body language, again, to combine you know, the poses and the body language with facial expressions on the main figures to convey their inner thoughts and feelings. Well, Jesus is resigned. Look at that resignation. He's not resisting. He's not get, He's not looking over. He knows this is the guy that betrayed him, but look, he's not even trying to make the guy feel guilty or even point him out. He's just accepting that it's his fate to be arrested, tortured, and then die soon because he you know, supposedly talked to God and found out that was his fate. So he's in a state of resignation that shows in his face and his body language. And I already covered how these people are reacting like Peter over here and these two disciples here with disbelief or shock, most of them are or denial. So that's an, a new technique. That's part of the meaning invented by Da Vinci. Let's wrap it up with a, a formal analysis and then I'll take any questions you guys have after we finish this slide. Okay, so this is, uh, first of all, completely balanced. <laughs> it's Jesus in the middle, and there's six figures on either side, and the walls are the same exact, right, space, take the same areas. It's very, very carefully balanced. But some people feel it's unbalanced or weighted toward the bottom because the figures are all below the middle line. But I count the ceiling and the upper walls as mass, so to me, it's balanced both ways. I'll let you, you decide that. The rhythm is powerful. Even the pieces of bread on the table, you see them here, the little rolls <laughs> that come with your uh, Thanksgiving dinner packs and say, wait, whatever you want. <laughs> so they look like pre-cooked rolls, right? Uh, that's it. That's the only food we could see, I think. They're, they're obviously not wealthy. These were poor people, so they probably couldn't afford to pay for much. And so we see rhythm in the uh, bread. I mean, you just say the food on the table. Oh, no, there's some background noise. I'll try to wrap this up. And of course, in the, all the bodies, the heads, arms, hands, and of course, the windows in the room. This has scientific perspective, no question there's a vanishing point. And here we've got the atmospheric perspective, even though it's faded behind the figures out, out of the windows in the distance. Scientific perspective, atmospheric perspective, foreshortening, diminishing sides. We've got everything and overlapping of all the figures over each other in the table. Uh, it is stable and dynamic. I would say more stable on the human figures, although this group here is dynamic. But these are upright. These two men, Jesus is upright. This guy's upright. This man, so it's a mixture. The room is really stable, right? Because it's a rectangular space, but it looks dynamic because of the angle of the walls and the ceiling. Okay, and the colors are a mixture of warm and cool on the clothing, obviously. Lots of blue, cool blue colors. And then warm colors on some of the robes and all their skin and most of their hair. Cool on the tablecloth and the wall, originally both walls had this white color, white plastic. Um, this room isn't the same exactly as it was when this was painted, but it's still the same room. It's not used for anything now except to store this painting. Um, and then there is, uh, let's see, what? oh, thin line around the figures, all the figures. The largest mass, well, I guess you could say it's the room itself and then the table. And then you decide, is this one mass, these three people grouped together here, and then this is another group, or are they all one mass? And if not, if they're each separate, then you decide what is the largest single human figure. It's a close call. It might be Jesus, right? Or possibly uh, this man here, he's standing at the end, or this man. So you decide that would be you know, up to you. All right, and then let's see. Modeling, it's soft in this one, but it wasn't originally, because in this photo, I mean, because of course I said it's faded. Uh, it's deteriorated. It started deteriorating within a few years after it was painted. There was something wrong with the fixative. You know what a fixative is that Da Vinci was using. It was an experimental new chemical over the painting to protect it. And it had the opposite effects, unfortunately. So this has been restored, by the way, but uh, this is a quick aside. A woman artist spent 10 years restoring it along with a crew of assistants getting up on a ladder every day at least five days a week for 10 years she went blind literally lost her eyesight doing it and she was interviewed on a documentary which had an english subtitle below so i could see what she was saying as you're waiting for going to the museum you get to watch this documentary about the restoration the italian government paid for it 15 million dollars in 10 years and the, and the interviewer asked her um, would you do this again if you knew you were going to lose your eyesight she said absolutely 
it was a labor of love. It was worth it. She did a great job because she had to pick apart all of the later paint that was plastered over this or stuck on top of the original, getting down to the original faded layers, then send samples of each section with each color to a chemical lab and analyze how those colors were made and then have each color made separately and then apply them. You can see why it took so long. Pretty amazing. Mr. Wilson, why yeah. did, you, did you say it started to deteriorate right away? Very soon. I think it was three or four years. Yeah, there's another reason that it's uh, it, it had deteriorated. It tourist breath. You know, there's not part of the meaning, but it is an interesting fact. Tourists were allowed to go up close to it and go, oh, you know, tourist breath is, is full of moisture, of course, all human breath is. And that started deteriorating it even after it was restored like three times in the first three centuries. So starting in the 1700s, it became a tourist attraction. That far back, people were going from all over the world to see this painting. Right. But did you say it started deteriorating because of a technique Da Vinci used to preserve yeah. it? it no, no, that's a good question. It was not that quite that straightforward. It was a combination of moisture because uh, northern Italy, well, all of Italy is pretty moist, has a lot of humidity, especially in the winter. And so moisture seeped in from the uh, outside on the wall itself, A and B, the fixative use, both, both. But what I've read, I don't know if they could say one is more at fault in the other. The two together just was a toxic combination. But they've managed to stabilize this. It's an air control, uh, sorry, climate and temperature controlled room. Uh, yeah, that's why they don't allow more than a certain number of people in their time and there's a rope to keep you further back from it. I was allowed to get within uh, 10 feet of it. <laughs> and I didn't breathe on that. I held my breath when I took my picture. Okay. So let's, I think I've covered all the modeling may look soft and diffused, but it is not. It originally was sharp and realistic as it would just simulate textures on the hair, the clothing and the skin and, and the, the walls. Okay, I think we've covered all the elements, right? Oh, I, got a, I got a question. How did they, uh, how did she go blind on- Oh, painting? just uh, getting up. So did uh, Monet and uh, Renoir, a lot of paint. Well, Renoir was a total blindness. A lot of painters do when they get too close to their work for too many years. Well, sometimes people already are going to have that problem as they get older, but she wasn't that old. They saw her, I saw her interviewed on camera, maybe late 40s, early 50s. And so you got to back that up 10 years because she started 10 years before the interview. Uh, it was just the close up work. You can do, you know, you got to be careful if you have, you know, as I do, congenital birth you know, condition with the weak eyes. <laughs> One way or another, you want to take care of your eyes, right? So that's the only explanation I can give you. It was just over long, long hours and hours. She didn't just work eight hours a day, sometimes 12 hour days, five days a week, sometimes six maybe, and didn't give her eyes enough rest. I guess you could put it that way. Yeah, plus it could have been somewhat combined with some other thing, but you didn't have macular degeneration, you know what I mean? That wasn't it. That would be a separate genetic con. No, she literally was blinded by the excessive close work of this project, and she didn't hesitate to say she did it again. Pretty impressive. Dedication. <laughs> Very strong form of dedication. Okay, any other question now about anything we've covered? We finished all the slides. We're all caught up. But, uh, you know, I won't be uh, Monday, no class, right? I'll see you all a week from today. And I may not be able to respond to any emails until Tuesday of next week. Okay, anybody on? That's my office hour, so it's a good chance to ask questions in real time about anything having to do with the slides or the papers, which aren't due for three weeks, right? But you should get, you should choose your, I should have said this, that you should be picking the topic you want to write about now so you can start the research and outline what you want to write about. I wouldn't wait till the week before it's due if you want to get a good grade. And also you can ask me questions, of course, uh, email questions, I won't get back to you next week or voicemail ones. But you can also forward me a sample of the paper if you don't wait till less than 48 hours before it's due. And then I can uh, give you uh, feedback usually within a 24 hours or so. Uh, as to whether you're missing anything. Uh, but, you know, however you choose to do that, again, the point is don't wait till, you know, five days before the due date to start working on it. Uh, usually that doesn't lead to a good result. Uh, so pick a work you care about, one you're passionate about or really interested in, and that you can find good research on if you haven't already. Okay, um, I'll still stick around another whenever it is, minute, two, three, four, to answer any other questions anybody has. Um, I think I got one. Oh, sorry, you first. 
Oh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering again, when is your office hours? Now. <laughs> I oh. don't really have <laughs> office hours. So, see, they don't give us this. I, I live in Berkeley, so this office, I'm not sitting here during the time I'm teaching. So I stick around as long as need be after class to answer questions, plus by arrangement. Uh, not on Zoom, though. I get Zoom headaches. I'm already doing four Zoom classes a week, so that's enough. Uh, but I will talk to you or email you with answers to any questions. But I mostly do it right after each class. And then if that doesn't answer all your questions, you can follow up with an email or a phone call or wait to the next class, of course, as you might want to. But you can ask questions at the beginning of a class, too. During the lecture, they should be related to just the slides on the screen, any questions, so we don't get sidetracked. But at the beginning of the class or at the end, you can ask any questions you want. Uh, okay, and of course, Thank you. You, you can use the chat function too if you want, but then I kind of don't know if you did that unless I go out of my way to see if there's, let me see if there are any chats. Let's see, are there any? Oh, I don't see chat too. Okay, let's see what that Oh, somebody mentioned the documentary. Yeah. I'm not sure which book you guys were talking about there, Miranda, and you probably left us over here. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It is. I think it's just called the Isabella Stewart Gardner Heist. Oh, um, there is it. Oh, yeah, there should yeah. be. Yeah, it's fascinating. They think it was an inside job and maybe even the guards were in on it, but they were, t I think they had their mouths taped as well as, of course, hands tied and they were found in a closet or something. The next the basement was creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The basement, yeah. Make a good movie, wouldn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> Who would star as the lead thief? It's probably, you know where those paintings, I think, are? in some rich person's wine cellar. <laughs> Maybe within a few miles of Boston or, or just over the border in Canada or somewhere else in the US. I'm sure it was a designer theft, they call that, when it's commissioned. I know, I'm not sure. That's, that's just a leading theory and it makes sense to me. Someone paid to have those paintings stolen because they, they couldn't sell them, they knew that. They couldn't even show them except to their very close circle of equally minded uh, greedy fellow, whatever you want to call them, art lovers. Yeah, I mean, depriving the public of seeing masterpieces like that for 30 years is, is itself a crime, not to mention the theft. Uh, okay, so that's it. What's the documentary called, if you're still there? Nope. <laughs> okay, I'll have to look it up. All right, there's still a few more students that may or may not have had a chance to ask any questions that you have, okay? Anybody, anybody else? Um, I have one if no one else is going to ask one. Sure, Can we sure. look at your picture of the birth of Venus slide really quick? Because I just sure. have one question. Um, so I understand the difference between sfumato and atmospheric atmospheric perspective. But um, is that not like, you know, when you look at like kind of the right side and the forefront with the figures, that looks fairly detailed and, and deep in color. But then the background, it kind of looks like there's like a light wash. Would that not count as the same thing? It's not, it's just like lighter, paler in that background and in yeah, the center, it doesn't count. Good something. question, yeah. I think the evidence I've read about Botticelli's career and his work is that he, he just used more light pastel hues and mixed them in his paint with his regular paint. Because of course, oil paints were a new invention, but not brand new this far back. Uh, I mean, this far forward. They'd been invented in like the 1420s in Italy. So they've been around a while. So he probably mixed them with some kind of other but a wash is a separate thing after the painting is, is not totally done, but nearly done after. I don't know if you wait till it's all dried. I could ask my wife. She's a painter. She does a lot of landscapes. And I think she occasionally uses that technique, though most of hers are rather realistic landscapes. Um, uh, I may even ask you that question and get back to you. But right now, as far as I know, it's a two separate things. This is just as you were sort of hinting at his technique for making the colors, the hues themselves in the actual paint more uh, lighter or pastel hues. Mm -hmm. I think so. And it's not Sfumato at this point, that technique didn't exist. Yeah. At least in okay. Western painting, yeah. Okay, and yeah. right, any other questions? Anybody else have? Mm -hmm. uh, would you, uh, would you would, did you say this had atmospheric perspective? No, I don't think it does. I mean, uh, I don't really see it because the horizon line is pretty, it's not really fit at all. See, even on the spit of land there, whatever that is that's supposed to represent uh, actual 
you know, landscape and then the the sky is no, it's yeah, if if it had like ships on the horizon that were all fuzz, you know, sort of diffused and you know uh, <clears throat> bluish and hazy, then you'd say it no, it does I don't think it has that sort of, it doesn't for sure at all. That's a good question. Okay. Any other questions from anybody at all? Because we still have many minutes as need be to answer the more immediate questions you guys have and because I won't be available on Monday. I hope you all take that day off and relax, right? And have a pleasant time with whatever you choose to do, family, friends, and your own home. Actually, yeah. So I guess that was, so don't bother coming to class on Monday or should we still check no, in if you no, do have? No, no, Monday. Monday's a federal holiday. It's a gift. Oh. Yeah. You didn't know that? Labor Day. I kind of forgot. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. No, it's a good thing you asked because that's an important point. You don't want to, it'd be very lonely. You wouldn't be able to log on and you wonder why. <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to explain to you because I'll be in a car driving back from, from rural Washington State. Yeah. But Glad you clarified that. Okay, because everyone should remember no classes anywhere of any kind in any college campus or public school campus or private. Well, maybe some private schools, but I doubt it. <laughs> Religious schools, maybe, but not public schools. Okay, any other questions from anybody? Because we still have the time if you think of one more or whatever. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. You guys had good points, good questions, good observations. Have a great uh, holiday weekend. Relax. Enjoy the day off on Monday. And I'll see you all on Wednesday of uh, next week, one week from today. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Take care. Yeah.